so that we have the recording. And um, welcome, everyone. It's uh, Friday, August 21st, if you can believe it. And we are lucky enough today to have um, two amazing women leading us in a conversation about women-led livestock businesses or women who are leading livestock businesses. They are my dear friends who have known, oh my goodness, for many years. And most recently, our connection has been through Women in Ranching, which is a, um, an organization that connects women who are in the livestock business and ranching in a, in a really meaningful way that enhances our whole selves from our, um, our you know, ourselves and our, who we are as people to our businesses and, and helps us to take big leaps that we want to do in, in our lives. So um, Beth and Cole have been inspirations to me always. Um, they are so, so courageous, so brave, so articulate, so entertaining. Um, and I just can't wait for you to spend um, some time with them uh, today. So we'll jump right in. Um, Cole, do you want to lead us off and, and really telling us your, what we're calling an origin story? How did you get started and why did you choose Livestock? Uh, thank you so much, Abby, and thank you everybody who's here, and thank you, Beth, for being here with me, too. Um, I love being a part of this herd. Um, just want to acknowledge that you're all here. Um, so, how did I get started? Um, I usually lead off saying I'm a non-traditional agrarian. I was born on the beaches of North County, San Diego, and it's been several generations since my family has been in agriculture. Um, I would say I'm more of a goat than a sheeple, uh, so my path in education and figuring out who I am in the world and my purpose was very non-conventional. Um, I created my own major in university and uh, led, that led me to studying agroecology and connection to supporting uh, preservation of culture in a developing world, and uh, I was quickly led to food. Uh, so my start really was uh, uh, kind of wanting to create my own adventure, which led me to which led me to livestock, um, and really acknowledging that um, my creativity and my non-traditional way of going about things, um, the best place for me is in entrepreneurship and following my passion and my work. Thank you so much. Um, Beth, do you want to give us a similar introduction? Yeah, sure. Awesome. Uh, so I'm Beth Robinette. Uh, I'm calling in from uh, my day job, which is working at our uh, local food hub, Farmers Cooperative, which I helped start uh, six years ago or several decades ago. Feels like a long time. Um, and uh, And so, I, I do that a few days a week, but most of my time is spent on my family's ranch. Uh, I'm a fourth generation cattle rancher based out of Spokane, Washington, and um, kind of got, uh, obviously I was, bo I was born into a ranching family, but I really got interested in being engaged in that work. Um, mm -hmm. Once I went to college and kind of lived in a, in a city and and experienced food that was not like the homegrown kind of stuff that I had grown up around and it was just a really kind of a startling wake up call to um, what our food system looked like and so I've been engaged in kind of tinkering with how, how to make uh, how to make food systems more community focused um, and also I'm really passionate about trying to use my experience as like a established multi-generation uh, person in ag to give opportunity for new people to come onto the land and get involved in land management. So um, I'll talk about the new cow cowgirl camp program that we host at our ranch probably more in a little bit, but yeah, that's, that's my work in a nutshell. In a nutshell. Yeah. It's amazing. Um, and uh, if you could, uh, Beth, just to continue on with that, um, your focus and passion for livestock. Can you describe for us the landscape of livestock agriculture today? Where are the opportunities? Where are the markets going? 
Uh, I mean, the, to be blunt, the landscape of agriculture, of livestock agriculture as it is right now is uh, pretty white and pretty old and pretty male dominated. Um, and uh, while there's, I think, reasons to be concerned about that, uh, I also think that that represents a tremendous opportunity, um, which is just that like a lot, a lot of land is going to become available um, for new management in in the next 20 years, say. And uh, I think as long as we're strategic about and thoughtful about how that happens. Um, there's there's plenty of room for new people to to get into livestock businesses and um, and do that in all all kinds of creative ways that I think are more um, more environmentally and and socially uh, conscious than kind of how how the industry has operated to date. If that's not me being too like hopeful and hippy dippy, it's probably going to be very hard to do that. <laughs> How, do, how are you doing it? I, I, I feel like you're, you know, through Women in Ranching, I know that you are deeply committed to this new vision of agriculture, and yet you have, a, you have strong roots in, in it um, as it exists today. So how are you managing that, that and doing it in your own life? Uh, I mean, I think that it kind of goes back to the idea in holistic management, which is you know, kind of the framework that we've managed our family ranch under for the last 20, uh, 25 years, really. Um, I think I just have to be at peace with the fact that like, there is going to be some dissonance between my current state and what I'm managing towards. And, uh, and that I just have to do what I can each day to, to like try and move the needle in that direction. And, um, it's probably not going to happen at the pace I would like it to, and I'll probably make lots of mistakes along the way. But uh, I, yeah, I, I just feel like as, as long as I'm managing towards something and I'm, I'm moving towards um, connecting that dissonance. And what, what I mean by dissonance is, is this idea, I mean to get like so deep right off the bat here, but like this, uh, this idea that um, we are practicing agriculture on the land in a way that regenerates the land um, in a context, certainly in this country, and I would say most parts of the world, um, where social systems have been very extractive and, and certain people have been very purposely um, pushed out of uh, stewardship or ownership, however you want to view it, kind of role of land. And so I'm sitting here as like someone who inherited land that was, you know, taken away from indigenous people and I'm trying to manage this like foreign species on the landscape, my cattle, to try and get this outcome to put it back to some kind of higher state of, um, of ecological succession. And, um, and there's just a lot of complexity that goes with that. Uh, and I think uh, I'm not too attached to having the answer to that so much as I'm attached to the process of trying to figure out what all of that means. Mm -hmm. In a timeline too, right? Giving yourself yeah, time. <laughs> right. Yeah, I'm trying not to just like sit around and pontificate endlessly, but actually do something useful. <laughs> right, and I was thinking like also not having the pressure of like this has to be different tomorrow, but knowing that it's going to take time. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Cole, do you would you like to add to that? Yeah, yeah. I was I I wanted to know if I can break script and just like jump in with Beth at moments. Of course. Um, well, I, I think in my origin story, I didn't actually say what I do. Um, so I'm going to just say that and where I'm from, where I live. I live in Ojai, California, in Southern California. And um, this is the land of the Chumash. And I have dedicated my life to the work of land and livestock um, and really advocating for the next generation of agrarians and um, have really enjoyed connecting with people um, like. Beth, uh, who has really supported those of us who are coming in. Um, I'm an entrepreneur working with um, a byproduct of the meat industry. I sell sheep and goat hides um, that are sourced in the American West, primarily in California. And also I'm a contract grazer, just starting my own contract grazing business with sheep and goats here to provide a service for 
fire hazard abatement, invasive species management, and um, our overall general uh, enhancing our, our ecosystem and all of the functions within the ecosystem um, through the lens and practice of holistic management as my foundation and my training. Um, so I just wanted to say, I'm like, oh, I haven't said what I did. Um, <laughs> To answer the question of opportunities and challenges, I think right now with where we're at in our social landscape and our societal landscape of great change, which is so necessary and needed, as well as uh, our, our earth and ecological environmental situation in dire, dire straits, I think a lot of folks are at a place of urgency in figuring out how they can make a change and agriculture animal agriculture can be such is an impactful and powerful way to have rewarding work that does good on the land um, and again back to the societal piece that we talked about um, now now is the time when lots of the infrastructure that has been of the past that's been broken it's really a cool time for that transition to happen. And um, I'm really excited to be a part of a group of women holding the torch and doing so. And I think that, um, you know, as generally women in this work have, have played a different role in, in agriculture and, and, and ranching and farming. And uh, just through my own experience, I have seen such an amazing emergence of really, really badass women um, rising to and becoming entrepreneurs and leading their family outfits, um, being mothers while doing so. Uh, so with, with, the, with breakdown comes renewal. You know, it's like out of the ashes, we can do some pretty amazing things. And um, coming from a fire ecology, some incredible renewal happens. In fact, there's lots and lots and lots of species of plants and forbs and brush and trees that, that flourish after fire. And so that's my hope and opportunity um, from those challenges. It is incredibly challenging and it's really hard to make a living off the bat and our infrastructure for learning how to get into this, not just the technical background of animal sciences or um, ecology, the, the uh, academic institutions can really support those to go into a next level or the next phase of a career or, or learning. But I, I think that, um, I think that there's limitations in knowing how to start and uh, that's something that I know that Beth and I are really passionate about is creating, helping to create pathways for new people to get into this. And also for folks who have been into this to integrate into the new ways that things are being done to stay relevant and to be as impactful as possible in a changing world. Thank you so much, Cole. I, uh, I resonate so much with that as someone who went to an academic institution. I went to Cal Poly and studied animal science like a good ranch girl was going to be a vet just like everybody and then just didn't um just did not at all connect with or feel energized by industrial agriculture and so i thought i didn't belong in agriculture and i think a lot of people make that assumption and what i love about finding the regenerative movement for me is that it is women-led i see there's so much leadership among women in this movement and also that there is a totally different way of doing things just because you don't like driving on a tractor or whatever, maybe you do too, that could be part of it, but, or being part of an industrial system, you can still be part of agriculture in a meaningful way. So it's, um, I, I think it's so important what both of you are doing and the voice that you're bringing to the movement and, and um, showing women a different way. So speaking of, of that, uh, for back to Beth to start, what are, what are opportunities for learning in a constructive and meaningful way as women who want to get started in agriculture, in livestock agriculture in particular. Yeah, so this is where I get to do my shameless plug. Yay! Uh, we, have, uh, we have a webinar series 
coming up that's starting the 3rd of September, which is the uh, COVID online virtual version of a program that we've run the last several years at the ranch. Uh, it's the new cowgirl camp. And it's for people that are new to being cowgirls, but it's also to, for people that are looking for a new way of being a cowgirl, so to speak. So it's really a, um, a course that's made for women. It's taught by, by women. Uh, I, I co-teach it with my dear friend, longtime holistic management educator, Sandy Matheson, who is a retired veterinarian and has her own grass-fed beef and yak business. Uh, side plug for Sandy. She's also the number one yak AI technician in the world. Just so you know. <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah, not everybody has that on their CV. <laughs> um, and, and so we, uh, we have been doing it as an in-person course, a five-day intensive course for gals that just want to come learn the basics of what it takes to run a ranch. So it's quasi, um, it's kind of the basics of holistic management, the grazing planning, ecological monitoring, land planning, um, the decision making process, of course, like how to make, how to manage your life to make decisions that are environmentally and socially and financially sound, kind of balancing those, that triple bottom line. Um, and then we also mix in a lot of like practical hands-on things like low stress livestock handling, um, how to build a fence, um, how to do basic veterinary care, how to give an injection, how to palpate a cow. Uh, not everybody gets to palpate. Well, on the online version, nobody's going to get to palpate a cow, but we're definitely going to have very graphic discussions of palpating cows. Nice, nice. Um, how, to ca how to castrate a bull. That's usually a pretty fun hands-on task for the, for the ladies to participate in. I find it very empowering. Castrating uh, always is. Yeah, I think it's just, it, Everyone should know the world would just be sorry, a, gentlemen. Sorry, gentlemen. Better place. <laughs> yeah. All right. uh, anyway, that's not like the main focus of the course. Sorry to get sidetracked down there. Um, <laughs> but we do kind of. It's like a nice mix of hands-on stuff. So um, what we're what we're adapting that into uh, for an online format is that it'll be a twelve-week webinar series on Thursday nights from five to seven Pacific time um two hour course and we'll just do a different topic that we would normally cover in the in-person camp every week so um if you want to sign up for that we'll get you details for the link um it's five hundred dollars um we pretty much give we got a lot of scholarship support we've pretty much given all of that out but if you're really compelling maybe i can go find some more money um oh and sarah king my girl is here Sarah King is a cowgirl camp alum, and uh, hello, my dear. So lovely. I did want to. I did want to point out, um, having gone to cowgirl camp myself, uh, something that I think I've done a lot of training, and that's something I'll talk about because I think it's important to talk about how you know how we got here and what we learned and how we learned it. But I have to say something really unique about doing this with this cowgirl camp with women i think there's the differentiation that i've had in 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 other trainings uh is that we really do get in deep on the on the relational side of who we who we are in our worlds um in our communities um but by getting getting deep on some of the things that are a part of our work, but inform our work. And um, I really encourage you in the virtual, in the virtual training, training, I still think that there will be opportunity to connect with some really incredible people. And I think that there is a way in which um, relationships can be built in and, uh, in a different type of way than we general see, generally see in livestock um, work. And the friendships uh, that you create in this work are incredible because the work is really hard. And so I think the cool thing about this is gonna be that Sandy and Beth definitely have that dynamic in it. And anybody, um, uh, I, I hope to pop in, but anybody who uh, knows each other in this work, there's there's definitely these cool intimate relationships built. So I did want to point that out. Mm. And it is a small world, really. There's 
you know, there's the regen there's agriculture, which is small anyway, right? They say it's 2% of the population. And then there's regenerative agriculture, then there's livestock and regenerative agriculture, then there's women in livestock. So you're just, you know, it is a small world. And um, I think you get to meet some amazing people quickly, to your point. Mm -hmm. Anything else you wanted to add, Cole, about opportunities to learn in this yeah, space? Absolutely. So um, a longstanding project that I get a lot of inquiries about often and like what's the state of affairs the project of it's called the grazing school of the west and the grazing school of the west has really become more of a school of thought in my personal inquiry of how can we make how can we actually train people in the practical stuff on the ground in a like vocational matching um very similar to um, uh, spain and france where they have shepherd training but they those shepherd trainings have attachment to these vocational support hubs. They're kind of like matchmakers for shepherds who go through training. And so I've been really trying to figure out how to, how that translates in a Western context. And it's been, it's been a challenge to understand how, how to do that. And so I've been searching for the pathway that I could recommend for folks. And I know that, the new cowgirl camp is an on the ground example that is a fantastic way for folks to get exposure. Um, I, the way I learned the most effectively was on the ground in work. So apprenticeship is really important. Um, the new agrarian apprenticeship program um, led by the Kivera coalition is an incredible way actually that program has kind of spit out some of my dearest friends in um as you know comrades um in this work uh and that is uh i don't know how long that is but, but i think it it, it is a multi-season apprenticeship and that really readies people to see the underbelly of not just the things boots on the ground but really what it means to have a business in this work. So the new agrarian apprenticeship program, um, the Jefferson Center has a lot of, uh, of incredible training with modules of um, holistic management, which is a framework that is used to really address all aspects of this work. Um, I think there's a lot of opportunity for, for learning um, and participating in the process of opening up this 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 work to new people um, we're a really white community and now is a time in our learning is to understand the current landscape of those um, BIPOC folks people of color who are um, working to also make um, make a living on the land and meaningful work growing and raising food and fiber. And um, I think we need, in our process of learning, we need uh, learning how to get into this work. We need to, to acknowledge that um, there is a transition and there's work being done to, to, uh, to make these, to support these changes. So um, there is definitely uh, this reckoning point in, in, in our community and opening things up. Um, that was kind of a side note or side tangent into opportunities. Um, biggest opportunities are really rad people who will become mentors. Mentorship is so crucial. The thing I learned studying in Spain and France with shepherds is knowledge and wisdom that's transferred from those who are experienced to those who are learning is invaluable in this work. You can only do so much training, uh, classwork, workshops, conferences. You need to be on the ground and you need to have folks support you in that process. Um, knowledge and wisdom passage is as much as, as study is important. So find your mentors, find those networks that support folks like you because they're certainly out there and i think um i've offered abby to add to the resources provided after the webinar of uh, links to some of those organizations and um
just more information in general of where to start. And um, through my work with Grazing School of the West, I've created some, some, uh, some assets of, so you want to be a grazer, you know, the kind of quick and dirty of, if you want to do this, well, you need to know this stuff first. Um, and the first one is, it's really hard. And find your support group. It is, um, it is hard, but there's some, there must be something that's keeping you in it. Um, something that, which is I mean, in terms of like the shepherding and stuff. So I'd love to lean into that more. Uh, the next question for both of you is, um, what were the biggest lessons that you learned in your process that you wish you would have known in the beginning? Like, man, if I knew this when I was starting, and maybe that's some of the wisdom and knowledge transfer that we can share with the people here on this, this meeting with us today. So either, Beth, do you want to start? Yeah, sure. I, I think, uh, oh, so many things. <laughs> Working in a working in a generational family business is uh, very challenging at times. I'm sure Abby, you probably have some experience with this yes. as well. And so, like the the transition of of joining up with my dad as my business partner and also my father um, was definitely pretty bumpy, especially when I was like. 23, 24, and uh, thought I probably knew a lot more than I did. Uh, <laughs> and yeah, so, so I mean, there's definitely been just a lot that I've learned. I, I've just learned really powerful lessons about how to work with other people, though, um, because it's, it's a very different relationship from any other business relationship that you have, because you can't fire your dad. Uh, <laughs> or, you know, it's not, not like if you worked in a company, you might just quit and go somewhere else, or, or you might try to push the other person out, whatever. It's like, no, we absolutely have to find ways. And I, and I do actually have like a tremendous relationship with my dad. He's my best bud and I'm so lucky to get to work with him, but, um, it's also definitely super challenging at times. Um, yeah, just learning like the interpersonal skills of how to, how to do that so that we still get to enjoy our um, our relationship when we're not at work um, has has taught me many many valuable lessons about how how to be a person in, in the world um, and how to get along with other people as well. Um, and I think the other thing that I and this also really has to do with kind of the legacy of being in a, a family business. Um, just realizing that like the so the solutions to the problems I'm facing may have really unconventional uh, uh, sources. And when you're so kind of like in a way of doing things that's been passed down, um, even in a family like mine where our management's very progressive and like my dad's super open-minded changing things, there's still these ideas of like, family and and like being able to hire help and I felt a lot of pressure early on of like I did I had to know how to do everything and I didn't feel like I knew how to do anything and like my husband is not involved in our livestock business at all and if you have had the pleasure of meeting him in person you would see how laughable it is that he ever would be <laughs> <laughs> I saw some pictures of him you had on Instagram where he was, yes. it was yeah, so he awesome. Help. I know he helps, he helps with his, in his like tank top and man bun. He's such a goofball. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, I felt like so much pressure. As, as, like, I was like, I'm never going to be able to do this. Like once I don't have my dad here to help me, mm -hmm. like I don't have a partner. Um, we had never, we had not had an employee on the ranch most of the time that I had been alive and it had been a long time. So it was always just like family does everything. Um, and it was a big like mental opening for me to realize like, oh no, I can totally just hire people to do stuff I don't know how to do or figure out how to partner and like bring new people into the business. Um, and that's kind of like my, my latest level of evolution is thinking about alternative structures for ownership of, of livestock businesses and thinking about worker-owned cooperatives, which my time at Link, you know, this is also uh, our farmer's co-op is uh, a hybrid 
worker owned farmer owned cooperative. So I'm also a worker owner here at this company. Um, and just thinking about kind of how to, um, how to bring new structures and new partnerships in a way that like disrupts some of the power dynamics that I think are actually really can be really damaging in, tr in the way that ranching has traditionally been done in the kind of generational there's lots of really awesome stuff about the generational stuff, but there's a lot of really fucked up stuff about, sorry, there's a lot of really messed up stuff about the generational, uh, pat, you know, inheritance of, of wealth and resources that, um, you know, it, it just like the more I get to know people like Cole and other, other people that are trying to break in and not have that, that asset um, behind them, like, I just realized that it, it blocks so many people from opportunity that they really have just as much right to as I do. So I'm, that's a puzzle. I'm really, I haven't figured that one out yet. Wow. I've meandered a lot on that one, Abby. Sorry. No, that's beautiful. <laughs> Thank you, Beth. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I, yeah, no, I think you, you actually nailed it. Um, Cole, what do you think? I think I'm going to say the flip side to, to, to Beth's, you know, I think it's hard not having family or generational <laughs> support. Um, for me, there are, two, there are two things I wanted to say to this. One is that when you start a journey on a, I didn't know that I was going to become what I call an urban shepherdess. I didn't know that, but in my pursuit of knowing, trying to figure out what my steps were, working for a grazing outfit or helping to start one and then you know, working for a grazing outfit and then deciding I was, it was time for me to, to, to leave and start my own. There are so many barriers to somebody who doesn't already have infrastructure or have, you know, have a foundation in this work to start. Um, I'll speak to just farmers and new farmers in general, land access. How do you start a, how do you start a, a land and livestock based business on your own without land and land limitation and land access is very challenging. Um, so, or, or if there's no, there's no livestock already um, accessible or equipment or capital, um, not having the, the money or the leg up um, is really challenging and very challenging to go and borrow money when you already have say student loan debt or the cost of uh, health care or the cost of child care if you're a parent these are all really real things mm -hmm. and it's taken me a really long time i think a long time to get to this point where i'm ready for my own contract grazing business my own land-based livestock business and it has been an, a wild pursuit and I've had to do a lot of different things to be able to support myself, not get another job, but I've worked for myself um, since 2016 and um, building my sheep hide business has enabled me the financial stability to then uh, start this grazing business. Um, as I, somebody who is not married and has a partner to, to do all of this or have uh, share kind of financial burden. The financial side is really real. And so that can be a scary challenge or scary thing to jump into it um, in our current landscape that, that uh, doesn't support the backbone of our food and, f and fiber um, of our country. So, um, and then also in, in real quick. Um, no, no rush. The, we are people who are who are living and have life experiences and life aha moments and challenges some years are great some years aren't sometimes every four months there's something there's a shift um there's a new challenge there's you're figuring out who you are in your 20s 30s 40s forever um but for me i've i've been on a personal discovery and that has that has kind of created the rhythm of, of how, I've, how I've grown in my career and in this work. And time is nothing and timing is everything is what I've learned. Mm -hmm. And not just in our pursuits for meaningful, rewarding work, uh, 
but just life in, in general um, is that be gentle with yourself because there's really no place you're supposed to be at any one time. Life happens, plans always change. Life happens when you're making other plans, you know? Um, what has been the rock and foundation of my work is recognizing how I feel when I am on the ground with the animals, uh, when it's not always chaotic, but the friendships and the community that I'm a part of who also just really get it, you know, just really get what that feeling is. And so we're in the trenches together, not just on the ground sometimes, but just <clears throat> Uh, emotional and and like adulting and life challenges is we all kind of get it and so the community and bonds uh are are just so invaluable so to get through those challenges in in summation to get through those challenges um i would say the people um and the passion uh and the encouragement is really what gets you through those challenges perseverance holy smokes just perseverance mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. i i wanted to lean into this question of land access a little bit more because i feel like there's a lot of there probably are more people that don't have access to land to beth's point earlier than there are people who already do have access to land so can you tell us a story about how you did get how you did get access to land <laughs> Uh, well, That's as a mobile craziest. grazer, yeah, as a mobile <laughs> grazer, it, it's somebody, it's somebody who um, takes the show on the road, that's the model of our business. I like to think of us as migratory pastoral people. Um, it's, a, it's, a hard, it's a hard thing to be doing this work without a home base. Uh, but there are ways to do it, and I think it's in it's it's with partnerships with organizations uh, that have to steward and manage lands, um, land trusts, for example, municipalities. There are there are ways in which you can um, access this public underutilized land, and a lot of the time, it is just being really, really diligent in finding that person who sees the spark that you see in you. Really, you're selling yourself and how confident you are in, in your pursuit, even if it goes sideways. Uh, it's finding that person in any of these organizations or um, private landowners that have, have, um, have a land base. And then there are other uh, there are other organizations in California. FarmLink is a really good um, resource. There's the, um, is it called the New Agrarian Land Trust? What is it called? The Agrarian, we'll put it in the resources link, but they're on the East Coast. They do a great job in resources and accessing land. But I got a, a personal anecdote. I found my land base here in Ojai, actually just, 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 got that land locked in um, within the last two weeks. And to tell you the truth, you know what I did? I wrote, I created a packet that had a visual summary of my business, who I am, my wish list of, of, uh, of, of a land base, my, the benefit that would be brought to this, this landowner's land. And I essentially sent them to, to, um, sent them to mailboxes after looking at Google Earth around town, and I'm like, what would be the dreamiest spot? And I sent out a dozen of them, and I waited to hear back who was going to contact me. And uh, I got connected with one person who needed, we'll be learning as we go on, on what the scope of this is, but she sees, she sees, she sees the value and benefit, and she believes in me. And so Sometimes it's just cold calling. Sometimes it's just cold calling. <laughs> yeah. yeah. No, it's such a beautiful story, Brittany. You would have made the best journalist. That was what my, my advanced training is in journalism. But that they call it fire in the belly in journalism to go get the story, to get it done without ask, waiting to ask for permission or waiting for someone to tell you how it's done. And I, I think that's beautiful. Thank you. That is amazing. I would never would have thought to use Google Earth in that way, but that's awesome. <laughs> um, 
So we have, I want to open it up for questions from our amazing participants here, our audience if, up to this point, but let's hear from your questions. Um, if you want to use the chat window, you can click chat down there in your Zoom um, dashboard or, or bar. And I'll just write a little note there. It should blink in orange now to everybody. We, uh, Melissa and April have already found it and started asking questions. So I want to, I want to put that, those questions forward to you, Beth and Cole. Um, really fun things. Nick from the UK is really, is here and happy to see us. Stephanie from Chile is happy to. Um, our friend Susan said that's very inspiring. Um, so let's start with April. So uh, we all know that the West Coast is burning right now. So April says, as California burns, can you describe your fire mitigation efforts and who the other main players are in the US fire prevention abatement using livestock? So that could go to either of you and hopefully we hear from both of you. Beth, do you wanna start? Uh, sure, I can, I can kick it off. You're, you're in Cali though. <laughs> You're, you guys You're not are burning in Washington. Yeah, I don't. I don't want to take no. that whole time slot, but I could definitely. Yeah. All right. All right. I'll start. Well, so so we um, we had a fire on our ranch two years ago. We're in eastern Washington. So if you're if you're thinking about the state of Washington and you're picturing Seattle, it's nothing like that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's it's dry. We get four, fourteen to seventeen inches of precipitation. We have four seasons. It gets cold in winter, hot in summer. Um, predominantly ponderous, a pine forest, which is a fire adapted species, and the landscape was traditionally managed with fire by indigenous people for many millennia prior to um, European colonization. Um, and so we have about two thirds of our ranches is ponderous, a pine forest. And the other unique feature of our place is that it is, um, it, it, it is bisected by Interstate 90. So we have a lot of people driving through the middle of the ranch. Uh, and so what happened a couple of years ago was we, uh, somebody, prob a vehicle probably dragging a tow chain or something, sending sparks off, ignited a bunch of briars, brush fires all along the freeway and about three, 300 acres in total burned in that fire. Um, no, no houses or structures were lost. About hundred of that was on our ranch. So obviously not as devastating a fire experience as I know many, many people out there have had, but we did get our little taste of, um, of what fire did to the landscape. And the place that burned was actually probably the piece of forest we had done the best job of managing uh, we had logged it selectively a couple of years before to try and just take out, it, it's all secondary growth for us. It's all been, all been clear cut, um, you know, in the last like 50 to 80 years, I would say. Um, so just trying to like br space out the trees, doing a pretty good job of managing the grazing to reduce ladder fuel. And we still were amazed by how hot the fire burned, how high the kill rate on our trees were. Um, it was, it was pretty shocking. Uh, how, however, and just like the power of fire is really humbling and, uh, and terrifying and, 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 and also amazing. Um, now that we're two years recovered from that, it's been really interesting to watch how, how the land has responded. Um, it's really, uh, really rebounded much better than I, I would have anticipated. So even though like my initial reaction was like, oh my God, this fire is so, so devastating. Um, I feel like overall it's probably had a net, it's, it's almost doubled our productivity um, in terms of grazing days. So I, I think it has had a net positive impact, um, but also managing forests is like a, a real trip because it's happening on a time scale that's longer than a human life. Um, it's different from like messing with the genetics in my cow herd that I can change in like five years. Right. Uh, so it'll, I, I'm, you know, we're only two years into the recovery check in with me about 50 years from now. And, uh, I'll tell you how, how I've <laughs> been managing that. I don't think I'm quite ready to make a call, but, um, I guess my, my insights would be that, um, 
I think that we have just way undermanaged our wildland, quote unquote wildland, which has was historically managed for many millennia, like very quite intensively managed by indigenous people. And then we basically threw in the towel and had a combination of like utter neglect and extraction for the last 100 to 200 years. And we're reaping the benefits of that. Of course, that's compounded by climate change. So um, I think we're, we're in for a wild ride with a lot of, a lot, a lot more fires to come. And I, uh, I think we will hopefully be learning more and more all the time about, about how to manage that. And the complicating factor, right, is that we now live in sedentary houses that are very dispersed across the landscape. So it makes it a lot more, uh, you can't just burn down a forest <laughs> to like reset it. <laughs> that wouldn't, wouldn't go over well. No. Um, well. Cole, I'd love to hear from you. I think this, I wanted to combine it with a question from Melissa who lives in Colorado. And she said, much of our ranch just burned. Learning about post-fire regenerative land management. We run cattle, but are thinking goats or sheep might be helpful post-fire. Uh, I wanted to add too, before we go to Cole, that um, my husband Spencer did a webinar with Alan Savory a couple years ago when Napa, when we had those horrific fires in the Napa area, I think it was 2018. Um, and then now they seem to be so common, but that was one of the first really awful, awful ones. And uh, anyway, I'll send that out as a link so you guys can watch that as well. But Cole, what are your thoughts on, on, on the two questions? Too? Yeah. Um, I like look at the time and I'm like, holy smokes, we need more, holy smokes, literally. Um, I'll also include in the list, um, I did a webinar called After the Fire um, mm -hmm. with Alan Savory um, and uh, Darren Doherty. And it was, I think it was a couple other dudes, but um, I think that was really valuable. Um, there was information there. So to answer that question, um, both of those questions, I... I have a really heavy heart today. Um, I have currently friends with thousands of sheep who are hiking their sheep uh, off their grazing land and have been all night um, with a large fire that, I mean, they're all over right now. Um, a large fire in Lake County where they are. Um, so my heart goes out to them and all of the folks who are suffering and in chaos. Um, <laughs> they have anecdote from previous fires of the places that they have grazed with sheep. Um, the, the homeowners associations that they've grazed around uh, did not suffer uh, the, the same way in which other land bases that were not grazed, of course. Uh, so there, there is evidence and proof of how effective this is. California is working at state level to uh, fund more on the ground, more extensive projects and prescribed grazing is one of those things. It's hard when the, the money is coming from top down um, to get to those communities fast enough but as decision makers become more educated on how our work works and how we're different than a normal contractor or a general contractor in vegetation management with chemicals or weed whippers, um, we're seeing progress. Something that I would answer to as a, a, as a solution is a community-based solution that um, I'm calling a community-supported grazing program. Basically, it is uh, fire safe councils who have a region or in a township here in Ojai, there's a fire safe council. And what I'm doing with the fire safe council is providing technical assistance at this time to develop a, um, a community, both private landowners and uh, nonprofits and public entities, um, the Land Conservancy, to essentially create a kitty pool fund to then um, go and graze identified areas around the Ojai Valley in a, a more comprehensive way. That was supposed to kick off this year before fire season, but due to everything, um, it's postponed till next year. 
the goal is to document that whole process and then have that process be a model for other communities to adopt. So, there, excuse me, there are, there's a nonprofit body, which is the Fire Safe Council. They're able to collect the monies, nonprofit tax deductible monies that then go to fund the prescribed contract grazer. What does that create? It creates the opportunity and need for more grazers that are smaller and more regionalized instead of huge, big, big operations that go all around the Western states. My hat's off to those folks, but I think the next, the next iteration, um, there's enough room for small, medium, and large grazers. We need communities to adopt it, and we need to allow communities to have the resources for educating the public and the decision makers on why, what the benefits and advantages are in the right context. Um, and show the, the, not just the dollars and cents economic piece, because sometimes it's more expensive, but the ecological piece and the potential for job creation piece in communities. Mm -hmm. So that's a big effort that I think, um, I hope to report success in here in the Ojai Valley, uh, because I think it's a model that can be replicated and dispersed and create more opportunities for new grazers. Um, and to answer the, our Colorado buddy, um, I hope that there wasn't extreme destruction. Um, uh, there are regional grazers in, in Colorado, and I think that um, grazers of sheep and goats, I think it's a tremendous idea to bring in sheep and goats in post-fire uh, management. Uh, sheep and goats at different densities will, will eat different things than cattle. And sometimes on slopes and whatnot after fires, we have a lot of open ground um, without ground cover. And the hooves of sheep and goats, uh, can, and the, the, their less weight, um, can be a little bit more gentle in these, these softer soil situations. Uh, so I highly recommend sheep and goats Again, everything has to be in the right context for post-fire management. Uh, but we need more of us. We totally need more of us. So. Awesome, you guys. I can't believe we're almost at the end of our time. So I, I want to answer two more questions. I want to send one to Cole and one to Beth. Um, so I'll read them and then send them to you and then we'll wrap up. And just, just so you guys know, I'm taking a, um, notes on all these amazing resources that Beth and Cole are mentioning. And I'll put those in the packet along with the recording that you get after. So this is from our friend Susan. She says, given current circumstances that she has, an elderly parent needing caregiving a two-year-old, living in suburbia, I've got a vision of cobbling together multiple smaller properties because that's what I see available. Is this even feasible? Ridiculous? Wait and skill up in the meantime? I have a farming background, 300 acres, rural Canada, and this wealthy suburbanite population isn't really my jam. I guess the question is, is it worth setting up if only for a few years in a given context, or better to wait and hold out for something you can commit to long term. We have like a minute to answer that question. Oh, sorry. I'll answer it. Yeah. Um, so there's contract grazing for hire, right? But there's also other awesome, another awesome model uh, being spearheaded and developed by um, and underway by Sarah Kaiser, um, the Pen Grove Grazing Project, which is a model that's fantastic, and it is all about neighbor uh, neighbors who have land bases. Um, there's, there's someone with livestock and it's about really stitching together the community, uh, for that, that grazer to then go and graze the neighbor's property with the help with the neighbor in instances, the neighbor's checking on water and things like that. That model is a fantastic one and it's really in support of the, the grazer and land access. Um, Sarah and I are working together to... Um, bring resources to folks like you. Um, you just got to find your, your people to collaborate with who have a little bit more capacity. So I don't know if I think the time is now. Um, I'm happy to talk to you and um, introduce you to Sarah. And I think she's on the call. Um, so there are ways that commun communities in suburbs, I believe, can do it if there's a land base. Awesome, thank you, Cole. And then Beth, for you, this comes from St Stephanie in Chile. 
She says, I'm managing my family's farm in Chile and I'm in a very male dominant traditional farming environment. Hmm. But I'm convinced that the regenerative model is the way to go forward for all the social, environmental and economic benefit it produces. I work with a tremendous team of 70 men and women. How do you recommend going about convincing the whole team that this is the way to go for everyone's well-being? <laughs> and you have a minute, Beth. <laughs> Oh my gosh. Great. Perfect. No problem. Um, well, I will, I will tell you if you're not connected with the Ovis 21 folks, uh, I'm sure Abby can send you contact information. They run the savory hub in Patagonia. Um, I would definitely recommend reaching out to those guys and gals. They have some awesome women on their team as well. Um, just to talk to somebody who's like more regionally contextual um other than that i would say like just start start small on small wins and keep keep building and uh you know it's not it's not going to be a process where you like you transition every like every, everybody's not going to have this aha moment all at the same time and it's going to happen like unfortunately it's just much more complex and and uh and slow moving than that a lot of times but i think as much as you can get those people that are on the fence like looking at a context where what you're proposing is actually working and you can really sell like this is going to make your life easier like we're going to be I, I think quality of life is a major thing that is missing out of a traditional farming context that is really well integrated into into holistic management um so not everybody recognizes the value of that but people need it whether they know it or not <laughs> it's so true it's so true a lot of people in that environment are so out of touch with it um I was, thank you, Beth. That was not easy. That could be a whole webinar in itself. And in fact, we had that um, with the Savory Institute, we did a webinar on how to, how to, um, the idea was like how to change farmers' minds. It wasn't called that, but that was the, the gist of like, you know, how do you get people to be open to different approaches? And the idea, the, the gist is that they can't, um, you can't force anything. You have to just answer questions, answer questions, answer questions without pushing anything until they're ready to try something. Um, awesome. This has been so amazing. I wish we could go on for another hour. I could spend endless days with these two amazing women. I wanted to share some resources. I love this. This is Brittany's, uh, sorry, Cole's um, slide about her work. Uh, it'll, and then I have another um, packet that she um, will send out to, or, or she put together for everyone so that you can learn more about how to get started as a grazier. And I have a whole list of resources and links I'm going to send with this recording that, that Beth and Cole have mentioned. Um, and then this is, this will also come out, this PDF, so you'll have it. Here's Beth's con contact information. Um, her Instagram account is, is Lazy R Ranch. Really fun pictures, beautiful pictures. I recommend following that. And then the newcalgirlcamp.com is her website. Um, Cole's information is here again, but also on the previous slide. And then, um, mine here at the Jefferson Center, which is the savory hub that serves Northern California and Nevada, um, and does work across the West Coast as well. But the role that we play is to do this kind of convening and community organizing to uh, activate and regenerate our region. And it takes amazing women and men like all of you and, and incredible voices and leaders like Cole and Beth. So thank you all so much for joining us this morning and, um, and please keep in touch with us. Thank you. Yeah. So much. You all are fantastic for being here and um, best of luck to all of those around fire. Thank you. Have a wonderful Friday and weekend, everyone. Bye bye. And bye. much love to the other cowgirl campers who are on here. I saw you. I saw you. I love you. Bye. Hi, and Elaine from Pisces. Um, oh my gosh. I know. I Love it. All right. All right, everyone. Have a wonderful weekend. Bye. 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 I love you, Beth and Abby. Ah.